<coughs> so we're going to discuss uh, period or order finding and the related problem of prime factorization. So one of the hallmarks of quantum algorithms is this particular algorithm which helps us find the prime factors of a composite number. Uh, proposed first in 1994 by Peter Shore and as I mentioned several times earlier, this was the algorithm that really sparked interest in quantum computing and quantum information processing. So what I would like to do is uh, just a backdrop for that thing. What I would like to do, I would like to go bang into the algorithm. Uh, there's a lot of number theory associated with this. I do not want to delve into the details of the number theory, but I will provide hints to the underlying required theory when and where required. Otherwise, we'll never be able to finish this topic. So you would so you're welcome to look at supplementary material that discusses the number theoretic backgrounds of prime factorization. Suppose we have a natural number n, of course, which is greater than 2, and this is an odd number, and it's a composite number, which means it's not a prime itself. So we want to find out the prime factors of this number. And if this is a small number like 15, whose prime factors are 5 and 3, or 21, whose prime factors are 7 and uh, 3, or 39, whose prime factors are 13 and 3, and so this is something you can do at the top of your head. But if you have a large 100 digit composite odd number and you beset with the task of finding its prime factors, this is a really hard problem to solve with a classical computer. And this hardness or NP completeness as it is called in complexity language forms the basis of secure cryptographic schemes that are used in the e-commerce and military industries these days. The most famous algorithm is the RSA algorithm, which relies on the hardness of this problem, and it sends out to the public a big, large integer, a composite number, n, and the key for cracking this code are the prime factors of this number. Right? However, Peter Shore showed that with the help of quantum mechanics and quantum interference <coughs> and with the, a quantum algorithm, it is possible to find the prime factors of this large number, not with the exponential, but with polynomial resources. So I would like to go straight into the algorithm. And this algorithm is really a combination of a classical part and a quantum part. So there are some classical subroutines which can already be efficiently done on classical computers. And of course, there's a quantum routine which surpasses its classical counterpart. So it's a combination of classical algorithms and quantum algorithms. So the classical algorithm, first of all, is you're given a number n, and then you do a primality test. You test whether it's a prime number or, or not. So this is a classical algorithm to do that. So first of all, you want to check whether this number is odd or even. And you do this classically. You don't need a quantum computer for that. If it's even, then it's really a foolish problem to solve in the first place, but it's odd then you would like to proceed with it. <coughs> then you do a primality test. If the number n is a prime number to start off with, then you don't, uh, it doesn't have any factors besides one in itself. So it has to be a composite number. So suppose that number is n. Suppose this is greater than 2, if you want to do something useful. So what I would like to do is, first of all, I would like to put this number n and I want to make, give it a place in the quantum space, which means I need quantum channels to encode this number n. And the quantum channel comprises of qubits. Suppose I would like to do n qubits to hold this number n. How large should this small n be? So if I have a number, say, 15, 
how many qubits are required to encode the number 15? So 15 is a decimal number. How many qubits do I need? Four qubits. Four, with four qubits I can go up to 16. Right? From 0 to 15 in fact. So the number of qubits n that are required are given by the log to the base 2 of n. And I find the natural number that is immediately after this. Okay, so this symbol uh, stands for a ceiling. Ceiling means the integer just after log of n, because log of n can be a decimal number. But small n has to be an integer, so because you're talking about a number of qubits. So just look at the number of the integer that immediately follows this decimal number log m. Alright, so with n, for example, with n is equal to 15, I would use 4 qubits. So I put, I draw, so I'm going to, going to draw the circuit now. So I have n qubits, small n, okay. And for this algorithm to work, I also need to have another set of qubits. Because if you recall in the Deutsch algorithm and other algorithms, you do a controlled unitary operation. So I'm going to use the same kind of concept here. So I have, need to have another set of qubits. Now, <clears throat> the number of qubits that I would like to use, say, is m, small m. And I keep this equal to 2 times n. So if there are 4 qubits here, I put 8 qubits here. Okay, so these are m qubits. So this is 2, n is log of n, right? This is of this kind. So this is really log of n squared. So small m is log of capital N squared. Okay, so this is, I can call this to be equal to log of Q, where Q is n squared and it, it's the, uh, Q is a power of 2, a power of 2, just bigger than n squared really. So if you look at this prescription here, it's some power of 2 which is bigger than n. So this is how we define small m and this is how we define q. So if small n is for m equals, uh, m equals 8 and q really equals, so n square is capital N is now 16, so I take the square of 16. The square of 16 is 2 raised to the power 8. So Q is 2 raised to the power 8, which is 256. So with M qubits, I can go from 0 to Q minus 1. The integers that I can encode in this register range from 0 to 255. Let me recap. Small n qubits, then I put n which is twice of n qubits in another register. Let's call this the first register and let's call this the second register. Alright? And we want to choose a small n such that small n is the number of qubits, capital N is the number whose prime I would like to find. So I take the log of this number, but the log of this number can be really be uh, an integer plus a decimal part. So I take the integer that is next to this, next to this log M, the next higher integer, that's represented by this C name. This N equals two times this, but N equals this, 
So I use the formula for the log. This becomes log of n squared. Let's call this m as log of q, which really means that 2 raised for m equals q, doesn't it? So now I would like to find out q. If my m is 8, this becomes 2 raised power 8, which is 256. So with 8 qubits, I can encode decimal numbers or integers from 0 to 255. So this is the initial hardware side of this. How many channels do I need? Yes. Which n? Small or? Capital N is a number I would like to factorize. That's the number of qubits that are required to hold that capital N. Suppose my N is 21. This is the number I would like to factorize. So 2 raised power 0 is 1, 2 raised power 1 is 2, 2 raised power 2 is 4, 2 raised power 3 is 8, 2 raised power 4 is 16, 2 raised power 5 is 32. So I would need at least 5 qubits that can hold this number 21. So I put 5 qubits here. Then I would put 10 qubits here. So because 32 is the integer, it's a power of 2 that is bigger than, uh, than the number at whose prime factor I wish to find. 21 is smaller than 16, so 4 qubits are not enough. So I need 5 qubits. Yes, please. So why do we need m and why it is twice? So we'll figure that out later. Okay? <coughs> now let's, so this is our starting state. By the way, let's, this m is, uh, ye notation some of the now what I would really like to do is, I start off my algorithm in the state. Am I writing big enough today? Am I writing bigger today? Is that okay? So I start off my algorithm in the state psi on. Now how many qubits do I have in total? M plus N. So suppose my first M qubits start off in the state 0, each one of them. And I put this M times and my second register also starts off in this state and I put this n times, small n times. This is my starting quantum state. Now in the first state, what I would like to do, what's the general form that you would like to do in most quantum algorithms? You put a Hadamard gate here on all of these qubits, right? Got it? So now suppose the state that appears over here at this point, suppose that psi 2. Let's see what psi 2 looks like. Oh sorry, psi 1. Had a mark gate on the first register. So this creates all the states, an equal superposition of all states whose integer labels go from 0 to not n, 2 raised power m minus 1, from 0 to q minus 1, all the way from 0 to 255, if you're talking about 8 qubits. So in integer form, this produces all the ket l's, but l is now an integer, and this l goes from 0 to q minus 1. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 255. I am creating an equal superposition through the Hadamard gate. And now I need to normalize this. What should be the normalization factor here? How many terms do I have in the superposition? Q. Yes, so I need to put a 1 over and root Q here. And then, of course, this, nothing happens to the second qubit as yet. 
Now I do a big, big, big kind of gate, a really big gate. And of course, you can now imagine how difficult it might be to implement such an error-free gate because it involves so many qubits. So it's prone to a lot of errors, by the way. That's why this is so difficult to do practically. Anyway, let's assume that we have a big, big gate here. <coughs> let's call the unitary operation of this gate un because n is my number here. And then I put a small label a on, on top of it. Now I'm going to describe what this gate does. Okay, so this is just a symbol for this unitary operator. I still get 8 qubits here, 4 qubits here, or n qubits here, and n qubits here. Now I need to define the operation of this unitary gate. This is a controlled unitary operation, and what this gate does is the following. Now the first qubit, this is the first register. Suppose this is in some state x. First register, some, some state x. Remember this is an n qubit register. And the second register is in some state y. And what this gate does, now I'm defining the action of this gate. This number A, this is a natural number. A is a natural number. Sorry. Don't want to use the same again. A is a natural number, 1, 2, 3. A is less than n. A is greater than 1. This is a property of this number and A is a co-prime with n. Which means that the greatest common divisor, divisor of A and n is 1. In our part of the world, this GCD is generally called the highest common factor. Which means that the highest common factor of this number A with the number whose prime factors we wish to find is 1, which means that n and a do not have any common factors. For example, if I take the number 15 and I take the number 3, uh, do they have a common factor? Yes. So I don't want them to have a common factor. So I choose an a such that there is no common factors. For example, I might choose the number 4 if I am dealing with 15 or 2. Right? And so on. So, this is something that I would like to ensure. Now, the action of this unitary operator on this gate is as follows. So, I am defining this operation. This operation is, does the following thing. It leaves the first register unchanged. And the second register, y, exclusive or, or bitwise addition modulo 2, modulo 2 with a raised to power of y mod n. Now this is like slightly complicated. Now what does this mean? Sorry. What does this mean? So there are two parts to this. <clears throat> One is you need to understand what this thing means. Does everyone know what this addition modulo 2 means? It's an exclusive or. So if I want to find the truth table, so if I put some a and b here, let's not use a, let's use some f and g, and I want to find the exclusive or or of, of f and g. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is 1 only if either of the two numbers is, digits is 1. If both are 0, the answer is 0. If both are 1, the answer is 0. So it does an OR operation, but an exclusive OR operation. In other words, the exclusive OR operation really means that I add 0, 0, 
my answer is 0. 0 plus 1 answer is 1. 1 plus 0 answer is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. But 2 modulo 2 is 0. So this is really addition modulo 2. When you add two binary digits, when you add a 1 with a 1, the answer is a 0. Because there is no 2 in the binary system. So you have to add modulo 2. So the second idea that you need to understand is what do you mean by modulo? So if I have a number 6, just I just want to write number 6. Just Let's first understand what modular means. Modular arithmetic. 6 modulo 5. 6 modulo 5 means I divide 6 by 5 and see what the remainder is. The remainder is 1. Right? So 6 modulo 5 is 1. 6 modulo 6 is 0. 6 modulo uh, 7 modulo 5 is 2. Right? Se 10 modulo 5 is again 0. So I divide the first this thing with this thing and see what the remainder is. Right? So this is what is meant by modulo. So in so in another way of writing that they say that 6 equals 1 in modulo 5 arithmetic. So when everything is represented modulo 5 with respect to 5, 6 equals 1. Alright, so this is modular arithmetic. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking this. Now this is an integer. X is an integer. And this is really an n qubit register in which we are encoding an integer x. So x is some integer that goes from 0 to q minus 1. Some integer. And here we have on the second register after the after this unitary operator has acted the second register yields a new integer that new integer is y what was originally there in this register and you do a bitwise point by point addition modulo 2 with a raised power x modulo n okay so this is the action. So now this you just this just has to sink in. So let me tell you something more about this operation here. Suppose I have n equals 21. Example. Now I Choose a equals 2. So this number a equals 2. Of course, this is bigger than 1, smaller than n. I choose a equals 2. So now let's do the following. a is plus 0 equals 1. Modulo 21. Modulo 21 or modulo n. So a is plus 0 is 1. So I am looking at modular 21 arithmetic, modular n arithmetic and I am finding out the powers of a. a raised power 1 is just 2, a raised power 2 is 4 and there is a modular 21 everywhere. a raised power 3 is 8, a raised power 4 is 16. Modulo 21, a to the power 5 is 32. What is 32 modulo 21? 11. What is a to the power 6? 16. What is that? in modular 21 arithmetic. 
Got it? And this repeats. A7 is again 2. A8 is again 4. A9 is again 8. A10 is again 16. And A11 is again 11. Of course, this carries over. This goes without saying. And then A12 is again 1. <coughs> And the process repeats itself. So if I have a function ax mod of n, if I have this kind of function, then it's possible that this function repeats itself for some a and, and some value of x. Right here, for a equals 2, this function which is the exponenti modular exponenti exponentiation of A is repeating itself. So the function is periodic. So now we have a periodic function here. And the smallest r, which is a natural number, the smallest r for which r bigger than 0 for which a this part r mod n equals 1 is called the period or order of this function. Here the order is 6. Right? So if I, I can plot this in a cyclic diagram as well. So I take a this part 0 which is 1 I meant I take a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, and the process repeats itself. Just goes on. So I'm exponentiating with one higher and higher number. So I'm multiplying this with a, multiplying this with a, multiplying this with a, and at a is plus 6, I get to a off. So if I start off here, after six steps, eight, two, three, four, five, I get back to where I started. So a x is a periodic function, and the period of this function is r. Let's call this r. R is the smallest integer, of course, bigger than one, for which this is satisfied. For which a r, I can write this in another fashion: a r equals one. Mod of n, right? Or I can also write this in the following form: a r minus one equals zero mod of n. Okay? And I can also write this in the following form: a r over two minus one multiplied by a r over two plus one equals 0. Right? So this means if I can somehow find r, the period of a function, and that's this is a modular exponent function, and I can then construct these numbers, some number here and some number here, then the multiple of these numbers is some multiple of n. Because this equals 0 means, this really means that the product of these numbers is some multiple of n. It could be n, it could be 2n, it could be 3n, it could be 4n, 5n and so on. That's what this really means in modular arithmetic. So I need to find somehow this r. If I'm able to find this r, I might have a chance of finding the prime factors of n. This is the idea, the overall idea. So, the question of finding the prime factors is mapped to the question of finding the order of, of a modular exponent function. So that's what this circuit aims to do somehow through this kind of operation. So let's see what, what let's now implement this on our, on our circuit here. Any questions up to this point?
यहां समझ आया इसकी इसकी समझ नहीं फंक्शन से तो वट आर वी डूइंग केयर वी आर टेकिंग ए पावर्स ऑफ ए एक्सपोनेंट्स ऑफ ए ए एक्स मीन्स ए जीरो ए एज पर वन ए एज पर टू एट सम पॉइंट द सर्कल रिपीट इट सेल्फ so the steps it takes for the circuit to repeat is called the period of this function now what is the function the function is a is for x so fx is ax but i remind myself that i'm doing everything modulo capital m so i'm working in a special kind of arithmetic which is called modular arithmetic okay so this becomes a periodic function and my goal is to find A value of small x or a value here. Don't confuse this x with the x that I've written over there. Some natural number r bigger than one, such that a is per. I know that a is per zero is one. So I'm finding another r whose exponent a is per r is also one. So one is going to repeat itself. How many steps do I take in order to get to that r? That is the period of the function. right so i want to find out this r somehow if i find this r then i have a chance somehow if i manipulate this if i if r is even if r turns out to be even then it's easier to find r of two is another integer otherwise this is no longer an integer so i want to find out an r and i hope that by luck or by chance or by probability this r is an even number and then i construct this this expression and find it and expect that this is a prime factor of n after some classical manipulation right so i'm going to come to this but just want to motivate that we want to find the period of a function yes please why is it good one because so a is per zero is one this is a per zero this is zero one two three r minus one r okay so what i'm plotting here is so this is some number say so call it x some number and i'm plotting a is for x here. so a is for 0 is 1 a is for 1 is the number 2 then i have the number 4 then i have the number 8 then i have the number 6 something else a is for 5 is 11 and then a is for 6 is the same as what i have over here the next thing would be the same as what i have over here so this turns out to be this thing by taking these steps this is called the period of this function right when i open my laptop at the end i'm just going to show how you, how to do this mathematics so now we have a periodic function i want to find out what's the period of this function right so if i take so a is for 1 would be the same as a a is for r plus 1 so r is the gap between two equal numbers two equal exponents all right so where will so let's look at this algorithm again and let's find out what's going to happen at this stage what kind of quantum state do we have over here let's call this psi 2 Now psi two is. I need to apply u n some a on to my initial state, which is ket l, which is psi one, which is ket l. L goes from 
0 to q minus 1, 1 over n root q. And I have a 0 here, no diagram. So this is n qubits here. Now what does this operator do to the first register? It leaves it unchanged. What does it do to the second register? I need to find the exclusive OR of 0. Now 0 is a string, right, of qubits. How many qubits does the second register have? n, small n, right? So what I need to do, I need to find a, which is this thing here, which is some choice of a, some random choice of a. I choose an a and exponent, exponentiate it through l, I get another integer. But that's a long number, right? Because L is an n qubit register, isn't it? So A is for L is n qubits long. Could be even bigger, could be even bigger because the exponent could be even a bigger number that doesn't fit into the m qubits. So I take the modulo n of that number A is for L and then find its exclusive OR with, with this thing. So what I'm left with, exclusive OR of 0 with anything else is the other number. So I'm left with AL mod of N here. Got it? You, yes, please. Can you repeat this? <clears throat> if I had 0 and I have some bit sequence here. <coughs> now what is this bit sequence? This bit sequence is A raised power L. Now this could be, this is a large number, could be even bigger than what can fit into the small n qubits. Because L spans from 0 to q minus 1. So it takes the whole space of m qubits, which is a larger subspace than the second register. The first register is bigger, so it can hold bigger numbers. But then when you take it to modulo n, you are reducing the number, you are making the number smaller, aren't you? And when you are reducing it modulo n, you still guarantee that you will fit into the small n qubits, into the second register. Because the second register is bigger than, uh, than capital N, than what, it can hold capital N and can go beyond because it's the power of 2 that is bigger than log of n. So it can fit into the second register. This thing, this thing is, can fit into the n qubits of the second register, can't it? Because this is modulo n. You can never get a number, so if you do modular n arithmetic, you can never get a number bigger than capital N, can't you? You cannot, because that's the biggest number you can get is capital N. But capital N, does it fit into the second register? Capital N, does it fit into the second register? Yes. yes, it does, because you have chosen the number of qubits in a manner that it does fit capital N. Right? So when you take A is, A is for L mod, modulo N, this will always fit into the second register. And we take the exclusive OR with something that is already 0. The second register initialized as 0. The exclusive OR, so the zeros don't really matter. Exclusive OR of 0 with anything else, with 1, is the other number. Look here. If the first, if this qubit is 0, then the output would be the second qubit. This is 0, the output would be the second qubit. So the exclusive OR or with 0 is the second two, always. Now this is my Psi 2. Now where do I go from here? 
Now let's slightly look, let's wrap this up a little bit. This is a periodic function. Let's just unfold this a little bit so that the idea of the period becomes clearer. So I just take this for ease of writing, I just take this under root q to the other side, right? Just for ease of writing. Now, <coughs> L goes from 0 to q minus 1. So it will have how many entries in all of this? Q entries. All right. So the first entry gets 0. A is par 0. Get one, right? Now this is an n qubit register. This is an n qubit register, right? Zero means all zeros. One means just one at the least significant position. Plus L equals the next is get one. A raised to power one. Plus get two. A is part 2. Sorry? And, and of course, everything is modulo 2, but I'm not going to write it over and over again. Just want to erase this part. Then, get 3, first register, second register, A3, all the way up to G. It could be anything. Modulo n. n is some number. Big n is some number, right? I'll use examples, but this is very general. So if I write this up to r minus 1, a is for r minus 1, right? Then, now this sum is just continue, but for convenience, I move to the other row, just to make things clearer. Then I have cat R because R is expected to be smaller than Q. The period is expected to be smaller than Q. I have Q terms in all of this. So these are just the first R terms. Now the next term will have cat R here and this will have A raised to power R. So what is A raised to power R? It's 1. And this process repeats itself. R plus 1. Right? So, so this is r, r plus 1, <laughs> this is 2r minus 1 and a is power, sorry, r minus 1, sorry, sorry. This term will be the same because the period is this r, right? So everything is repeating, so then I can get another r, 2r, 2r plus 1. A1 3R minus 1 AR minus 1 Finally, finally I, I need to end somewhere, right? Suppose I end C minus 1R Get 1 Some C, some number, right? I want to find out what this number is. But then C minus 1 or plus 1 A1. And I may or may not reach till the very end. Because I don't know what Q is. Right? So I might never finish this row. Isn't it true? I might never go all the way because I might not have as Q 
might not be an exact multiple of r in other words. So I, I will end up somewhere. Suppose I end up r <coughs> plus r naught, some r naught, a, and here I have a is for r naught, where r naught is less than r. Okay, so I give you one minute to think about this, and then I'll give you an example of what I mean. What I mean here. See, they think I. Now let's look at an example. Suppose my capital N is 21. So the small n that I need is 5 because 2 raised to the power 5 is 32, 2 raised to the power 4 is 16, smaller than 21, so I can use the next one, 2 raised to the power 5. So I need n. So this also means that my m is twice of this, which is 10 which means my q is 2 raised power m. So I have 10 qubits in the first register, 5 qubits in the second register. So what is my q? 2 to the power 10. 124, 1 kilo, 1 kilo. Computer scientists would know the 1k. 1024. So now I have q terms in this sum, in this superposition. Looks like an entangled state. I have Q terms, 1024 terms. And if my if my R that I chose, if my R A were 2, then my R is 6. Remember that I don't know R as yet. Right? But just imagine that I knew R. Because my task is to find out R. And this is not an oracle. So my R is 6. So now each of these rows will have 6 entries. Right? The first row will have 6 entries from 0, cat 0 to cat 5. The sixth entry will go here. So now I have 1024 elements. And each row, and I just juxtapose them in rows for my convenience, each row will have 6 entries. So how many rows will I have? So the number of rows is uh, <coughs> C, right? In my notation here, the number of rows is C, isn't it? C minus 1 plus 1 is C. Now what is this C? I can find C by dividing Q by R and finding the integer next to it. 131. 131? So divide 1024 divided by 6. What number is that? 170 points, so this is 171. 160, 160. 170 are the way. 170 points something. Okay. So I have this many rows. All right. Now what will be the last cat here? What will be this R naught? Will I have six entries in the last row as well? No, I wouldn't. 
So what I need to find is uh, so what I need to find is if I take 170 C minus 1 multiply this with R and from this I subtract subtract this from Q I will get R naught. In other words if I took 170 and multiply this with 6 what do I get? So I'm left with 121, 122, 123, 124 terms in the last row. In other words, if I were to divide this, I would get 170, 4 out of 6, right? So 170 whole rows and 4 extra elements. The entire 6 won't fill up. So I will have 4 rows in the last, 4 columns in the last row. So my R naught is 4. So this is the idea. Only when Q uh, fully divides R, when R is a divisor of Q, will my R naught be equal to 0. Okay? So when my R fully divides Q, this is the symbolism for this. When R fully divides Q, or Q is a multiple of R, would my R not be equal to 0? Right? Okay. Anyway, so this is the scheme that I have over here. Now I can write this in compact form. <clears throat> what I next do in my algorithm is the following. So let me redraw the circuit. In fact, uh, I already have it here. So let me erase this part with me. Just it's a very it's a quite technical algorithm, right? Quite a technical algorithm. Lots of performance analysis, lots of maths associated with it. So we can't do all of this in class, but let's let's see how we how we proceed ahead. Some number of qubits here, some number of qubits here. Now what I would like to do is the following. This second register, <coughs> psi 2 is an entangled state between the first register and the second register. It's highly correlated. Superposition and superposition such that there is lots and lots of correlation between the first register and the second register. Right? That's evident in the way I've written quantum state. Now what I would like to do, if I measure one register, I will collapse the state of the other register. Got it? Now what I choose to do is I measure the second register, right? I put some detectors here. Uh, yeah, detectors down. Sorry. So each detector can give a click 0 or 1, right? I will get some output here. Now that output will be uh, some integer. Now there are n qubits here and this output <coughs> will be a sequence of zeros and ones in n qubits. Now that sequence of zeros and ones will be some integer. Correct? Suppose, I, let's look at the notation that I'm using. Suppose that integer is z, which means that this is z0, this is z1, all the way up to zn. I have n qubits, where each of these small z sub something is 0 or 1. Right? So my z is an integer, and from these digits, binary digits, I can construct an integer z, which goes from 0 to 2 is for n minus 1. So this z is some integer. Now we suppose that this z is represented, is close to a raised to power some r1, where r1 is less than r. Yes. 
कैसे किस ये जी तक समझ आ गया नहीं जी तक समझ आ गया पावर ऑफ सम नंबर राइट सो आई फाइंड द इंटीजर दैट सो ए रेस पर ए रेस पर आर वन विल बी द इंटीजर सो आई फाइंड द आर वन सो दैट दिस इंटीजर विल बी द क्लोजेस्ट रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ जी फॉर एग्जांपल दिस जी ए कुड बी जीरो वन टू थ्री टू एस पॉट एन माइनस वन सपोज आई गेट जी इक्वल्स फोर इफ आई गेट जी इक्वल्स फोर माई ए वन टू देन माई आर वन विल बी टू इफ आई गेट जी इक्वल्स फाइव माई ए इज स्टिल टू बट आई नीड टू चूज एन आर वन विच गिव्स मी एन ए रेस पर आर वन एंड नीचे दैट इज क्लोजेस्ट टू फाइव ओके सो दैट्स आई टू एन अप्रॉक्सीमेशन साइन इट Now, when this is the case, when this is the case, if I look at the expression over here, I have collapsed this state to a form. Now, remember, if you look at the second qubit here, it's a is for something always, isn't it? Isn't it? Now what? When I do a collapse on the second register, I will always get a raised to the power some. So I can either collapse the first qubit could be get one, the second qubit or the sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, the second register after measurement could be get one. The second qubit, the second register could be get a raised to the power one. It could be a raised to the power two. So it's some a raised to the power r one. Isn't it? Where r one is less than r, that's always going to be the case. So it's not actually, it's not actually an approximation. It's exact exactitude over there. The second register, if I were to measure the state, so this is the state psi two. If I measure the second register, what's my output? Free up the. What's my output? This is my state. I measure the second register. What's my output? Uh, in general, I collapse the second register. Right. So what can I collapse into? Like two L, the number. Look, my state is this. Me, a is per zero, hai, a is per one, hai, and so on. A is per R, and then it repeats itself. So, you end up with one row. Hmm? I end up with one row. So when I do a measurement on the second register over there, what do I expect to measure? What can I measure? I can measure any column, which means that it's possible that the second register collapses into the state get one. Just let me give you an example. If I have Cat zero, cat one, plus cat one, cat two, plus cat zero, cat three. This is my state. So this I put this state. As two qubits, right? And measure the second qubit. 
What are my possible outcomes? I can get cat 1 or I can get cat 2 or I can get cat 3. Right? So there is some probability amplitude association to this, right? So the probability of getting cat 1 is C0 square. The probability of getting cat 2 is C1 square. And the probability of getting cat 3 is C2 mod square. So I can get either of these outputs with some probability, right? Now if I were to get cat 1 as the output, then the first state will also have collapsed into cat 0. Exactly the same thing is happening here. Now, the range of the second registers goes from cat 1, cat a is per 1, a is per 2, all the way up to a is per r minus 1, and that's it. That's the entire range for the second qubit. Because this is the same as this. So my output is on the second register, my measurement outcomes A raised to power some R1, where R1 is between 0 and R minus 1. So my output is R1 where R1 is or less than R, right? So I can write this as less than R as well. This is my second result. This is a measurement outcome. Now when this is the measurement outcome, what does my first qubit collapse into? Just look at the state over there at the blackboard to the right. I would like to find out what should my first qubit look like. Hmm? NR? R1 come here. R1 we Suppose, okay, let's do it step by step. If my second qubit, second register, collapse into state cat 1, what's my first qubit going to look like? It's going to be a superposition of cat 0 plus cat r plus cat 2r all the way up to this. If my second qubit happens to collapse into state a cat a square, my then my second first register would be cat 2 plus r plus 2 plus 2r plus 2 plus 3r plus 2 all the way up to c minus 1r plus 2. Got it? So my first qubit has collapsed into some k r plus r1 where this k goes from 0 to I think C C minus 1 and I also need to normalize this there are C terms here so I know this so after I have made this measurement the new state that I have generated is this thing So I collapse the second register and I collapse it into this thing, A, this for R1, and I take all the first qubits, first register states that are associated with this A, and this is a superposition. Now this K goes from 0, it's, a, it's an integer that goes from 0 to C minus 1. So just as an example, if I get A, A raised to R1, I get a superposition of these states. Cat 1 plus cat r plus 1. So this is my r naught, r1 here. This is my r1 here, this second thing. And I have kr, k0 here. And this is the, I take a hop by r, another hop by r, another hop by r, all the way to the last row. Got it? So this is the state 
after I've made a measurement, I've done a collapse. Now really, really, so R1 is just some, this is how I define R1. This is the measurement outcome. Right? Is this making sense? So now we are at the 6.15 minute mark. What the next step, can anyone give a clue of what the next step should be? The next step would be to take the inverse quantum Fourier transform. Of, so now I forget about the second register. When I've done a measurement, in fact, might have annihilated the qubit, might have gone away. So I don't, may not have access to these qubits. Right? By the way, I don't need to actually make a measurement. I just discard those qubits, don't look at them. I would still would just look at a particular subset, I will get this state over here. Anyway, for pedagogical convenience, I have motivated that we are making a measurement here. That measurement collapses the second register into this state. And by virtue of the correlation between the first and the second register that exists inside the quantum state of psi 2, my first register is now in, a, in this superposition. So the first term will be, so let me expand this, k equals 0 means this will be R1 plus R plus R1 plus 2R plus R1 all the way up to the last row minus C minus 1R plus R1. where I need to define C now. The C is Q R or I'll explain this later. So if, if R fully divides Q, this is what I get and if R doesn't fully divide Q, this is what I get. This I get the next higher integer and I, in this case uh, I just get Q over R, actually this is not needed because it's an exact integer over here. So this is my first register over here. In the next lecture, I'm going to take this a step forward and I'm going to do the inverse quantum Fourier transform of this register. And see, how do I get the order R from this? Because I need to get R, the period of this function. And for the period of this function, I will make a continued fraction. And I will find the conversion of that con continued fraction. And then I will find out what the uh, prime factors are going to be. So after the quantum Fourier transform, I will do some classical algorithmics. And then in the next lecture, I will also show another version of this Shor's factoring algorithm, which is based on the quantum phase estimation algorithm. So your midterm is going to be next Monday. I'm going to post third homework either tomorrow perhaps. Uh, so the second homework, the solution will be uploaded I think today. So if you have any questions about the two